Let me welcome everyone. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm Brian Alexander, the forum's creator, host, and chief cad herder for the next hour of conversation. And I'm absolutely delighted uh, with this week's guest. We have a terrific topic, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. To introduce this week's topic and guest, I have to mention two things. First of all, in the Future Transforms career, we've looked at a wide range of topics involving technology and education. We sometimes zoom in to incredibly detailed technical details, but we also like to step back and think conceptually about the history and the theory, uh, the criticism of technology and how it works. And today's topic is going to look at how technology changes humans and vice versa. And in that context, how does that transform education? Now, the second way of introduction is to point out that this week's guest is a longtime forum participant. Tom Hames has been with us and asking great questions and telling terrible jokes all the time. We've been really, really grateful for him and all that he's contributed. And we're delighted to introduce not only him, but also his new book, Discovering Digital Humanity. If you'd like to take a look at it or buy a copy, just click the Discovering Digital Humanity button down the left side of the screen, and you can learn more from there. Now, without any further ado, let me, not for the first time, bring our friend from the Blue Room in Texas onto the stage. Welcome, Tom. Hey, I guess I've gone from the green room to the blue room. Well, I guess you have, um, and as long as you're not put in the red room for trouble. Uh, been, give me time. I, I just I'm, gotten started. <laughs> I am doing exactly that. I am doing precisely <laughs> that to give you to give you time, uh, and I will also give you a hard time depending on how it goes. Uh, Tom, I don't I don't think we need to introduce you to people too much because people know a lot about you. They through your conversation, through your and and through what you've been writing uh, in the forum. But also, I, I just want to give people a chance to think about where you might be headed. What are you going to be working on for the rest of 2022? Do you have another book coming up? Are you going to be teaching more government classes? What's what's uppermost in your brain? Well, those are not necessarily the same things uh, as uh, what I'm going to be doing is what's in uppermost in my brain. I never know exactly where that's going to go next. I've kind of uh, been kicking around the idea of another book. Uh when my publisher and I had talked about this book, he said, this is a, this is a, a, it's a, it's a really good book, but you're fixing problems that people don't necessarily know they have. And, uh, or you're defining solutions to problems that people don't necessarily know that they have. And so I've actually been thinking a little bit about working backwards from discovering digital humanity and um, looking at, you know, going back in some ways to my social sciences roots uh, and looking at some of the uh, constructivist and how we how we construct our realities around the goals that we're trying to achieve and then and then go from there to how do we plug in the relevant technologies. So that's kind of where I'm going. I, wrote, I put a link to a blog I wrote this week that's kind of thinking thinking in those terms. Um, I'm also working with the Shaping EDU project where I'm uh, innovator in residence and, and innovation strategist. And what I'm doing there is I'm working on the tool set project that we've, we're, we're sl slowly but surely getting off the ground to, um, again, use these sort of principles of uh, goals first and then uh, defining tools around uh, what your goals are as a way of, of selecting tools in a more efficient and effective manner. I mean, I think one of the things that we have struggled for the first 20 years of ed tech or technology as we understand it, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that date arbitrarily sometime in the 1990s, um, <laughs> But, um, you know, we've been primarily concerned with getting things to work. I mean, it's early days of technology, you know, and, and, and you remember what an LMS looked like in 1998. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and getting that to a level of uh, scalability and reliability has been a big focus of what uh, we've been, you know, what we've worked on, uh, you and I and other, many others in this room, I'm, you know, uh, for, the, for, for the last 20, 25 years. Um, 30 years almost now. Um, COVID is really a sense of time. It is the 2020s, right? Last time I looked, it was still the teens. Um, but now 
the problem has shifted in the last five years or so, at least, uh, to where we have this plethora of tools available to us. And the challenge in my mind is selecting what tools we need to do to, uh, we need to select to create our technology environments. And um, my goal has always been to try to help uh, normal people, teachers, whatever, uh, to, and students to, to, uh, to create, um, uh, to, to select these tools using, you know, coming up with frameworks to help people approach them in such a way that they don't get overwhelmed. And so that's been a big thrust over the last year and going forward, it will be too. Well, thank you, first of all, for, uh, for a solid answer, which manages to nicely combine both the ideas you're thinking about as well as the projects you're working on. Um, uh, quite seriously, that does it very well. Um, and uh, friends, if you, if you haven't had a chance to read Tom's book and a few of you just went and bought it, which is a great thing, um, I'm going to ask a few questions based on the, on the book. If you have had a chance to read it, this is a great time to ask the author questions, of course. But as we go, uh, Tom has a great gift for elegantly phrasing uh, and compressing complex problems into really accessible uh, sentences. So please feel free to jump in uh, and, and ask what, uh, you, know, at, you know, push back or ask for more or offer an example, uh, that kind of thing. Um, Tom, one of the, one of the things that there are a lot of pleasures I found in the book, which is one of the reasons I wrote a forward to it, um, is that you have this great grasp of history where you bring in everything from Tom Engelbart and the birth of ARPANET. Uh, you talk about the birth of Apple, Jobs and Wozniak and all of this, and you bring it up knitted together with your own biography and you bring it to the present. Um, I've heard some analysts say that right now we are kind of in the position with computers, network computers, as people were with cars in the 1920s. Uh, you know, we've, we've gotten to the point where they're, they're working and they're at scale and they've ripped up and changed quite a few things. But like you said, we're, we're now moving past the point of, is this thing on? Are we getting it to work? And now we're starting to look hard at how things are changing us. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious in education, uh, what kind of non-academic technological habits are we bringing in to academia? I mean, as the digital world changes us outside of campuses, how does that alter faculty, staff, and students when they get when they set foot on campus, when they enter a library or a classroom? Um, I would say less than you might think in some ways, uh, because I mean, looking at my own students, uh, the level of technological sophistication that they have uh, is not, you know, they're able to broadcast more. They don't necessarily recognize the implications of broadcasting more. Cool. Um, and, um, uh, uh, but, you know, in some ways, TikTok and, and, uh, and chats and, and, and texting and all that sort of stuff is not that dissimilar from the kind of note passing uh, we used to do in the old fashioned high school. It's just with a bigger cool. audience and a more distributed audience. Mm -hmm. um, the sophistication with which people approach technology is still in many ways very limited. I mean, uh, again, my students may be good at certain kinds of technology, but the kind of deeper technologies that are involved in serious ideas exchanging um, uh, is, is something that they've never had to do before. And the hard part for them is honestly the, is not so much the, the technology is a little bit of a challenge. It's more of a challenge than I often think it, I mean, it surprises me sometimes how much of a challenge it is for my students. You know, the first time I expose them to authoring a website or uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, something like, you know, and I, and I kind of ease them into that uh, using, uh, I, I let my students create their own discussions in Canvas, for instance, as, as a way of creating a light website and they create a blog mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. That kind of stuff, though, they've never had to do before. Uh, their familiarity with a word processor is limited. Um, uh, you know, Google Docs, yeah, and some are better than others, obviously, but there's a wide spectrum there. Um, and it really comes down to whether or not anybody's ever asked you to write anything seriously before or to create anything multimedia. And when I say multimedia, I mean just using images, visual communication, which I talk about in the book too. Those kind of things, you know, they consume it, but they don't necessarily don't know how to create it yet. So that's been a big focus, especially in my teaching side. 
Um, faculty in many ways, I mean, I've had to, I had to help a lot of faculty at the beginning of the pandemic, sort of trans panic, tr panic transition into remote teaching. Yes. Um, and, um, you know, understandably there, again, the pressures uh, there, there's a wide range and some people have been doing this stuff for a long time. Uh, and the usual suspects of people who I've been working with for years, uh, if not over a decade in many cases, uh, they kind of, they did new things. They used it as an opportunity to change. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, it was, it's more about reconceptualizing, conceptualizing your paradigms. Um, you know, uh, I never did a, how to use this technology session when I was doing that. It was always how to think about assessments in a remote teaching environment. Yeah. Um, and I remember, for instance, I had a um, uh, 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 English as a second language uh, professor was, who came in and she was all a panic. And she's I do all I do these quizzes in class to see if they're understanding stuff and able to relate stuff. And I'm afraid that I'm not going to be they're going to cheat on it. It's not going to work right. And so on and so <laughs> forth. I said, well, take a phone have them record themselves. Everybody can, almost everybody can, the ubiquity of that technology is, is pretty widespread. So have them record themselves. And, and, and now you've also got their speaking capabilities. The objective here is, do they understand English? Can they speak it? Can they, can they mm -hmm. relate it back and so on? If that's the objective of your assessment, which it was, this is an actually a better way of doing it than the way you used to do it in class. You know, I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious, Tom, um, and just just one quick story. I had a, a, a friend of mine who was teaching at a, a college aimed at Japanese teenagers, um, and he found that the students had almost no experience with uh, Microsoft Office. They'd not used uh, Word. They hadn't used Excel. They used numbers and text all the time, but just entirely on phones. Um, right. And, uh, and they were off of it. But I, I, I'm curious. Uh, quite a few of us celebrate the idea of digital technologies and as a way to enhance productivity. But I'm sorry, producing stuff, making stuff, creating stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have John C. V. Brown, you know, celebrating fandom and that kind of thing. But but you're saying that most of your most of your population, the students and faculty, come to campus experiencing the digital world primarily as consumers. Yeah, I mean, I think it. Uh, there are exceptions, obviously, but uh, mm -hmm. um, but I would say, and I teach at a community college, so my students tend to be less less affluent, less have less access um, to basic digital, uh, to you know, to to the kind of technologies necessary to create things. And um, there goes there goes one of my dogs. Um, I really hope so. If it was something else, I'd be deeply disturbed. <laughs> Um, but to be able to create things and um, uh, they, they don't have, they may have a phone, but not a computer and creating things on a computer is not impossible, but it's, it's difficult. Right. Yeah. And, um, uh, and so. Um, that's interesting. That's, that's an important yeah. transition. That's an important shift uh, in, in, in the chat. Uh, John Hollenbeck uh, says that you will treat uh, computers as appliances. Um, and I think in this sense, it's that kind of passive appliance, like a television or a clock radio. Um, well, let, let me, you know, uh, when that's a very, very powerful statement, and that helps explain quite a bit of our experiences, I think. Um, I, I, and in the chat, Roxanne mentions her GE oven is, is internet connected, and so that's another appliance. No, it, one of the powerful themes in, in your book uh, is getting people to think in two ways. Uh, and I think these two ways help us think about ways of making people more generative, more productive. Uh, one is by emphasizing structure and one is by emphasizing space. And I, I'm, I'm wondering if you could just say a bit about the structures that you're playing with and recommending to people. What kind of pedagogical or other design structures do you recommend for really unleashing the creativity and learning of students? Well, I mean, I, I think you can't you have to recognize structures as inherently conservative organisms um, because we build structures in order to put things in place in order to freeze things in place. And there's a, there's, a, there's, a, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but that's what they do. I mean, that's why we build a structure. That's why um, yeah. everyone drives on the same side of the street uh, in this country, at least. Um, 
uh, everyone writes from left to right in English. Uh, everyone, at least that's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, but these are structures that we put in place in order to create efficiencies. And, but we also have to recognize that they they freeze us into place. Like, let's just pick writing for a moment. That seems like a such a totally innocuous structure, but it also creates a space in the sense that as you write in a traditional sense, it creates a linear narrative. You know, you go from bottom, a top to bottom, you know, left to right, you know, and then, and there, and it's a chain. It's like a giant snake. If you, you know, look at how you read a book. Right. Um, but if you switch over to visual learning or I mean, visual communication, now all of a sudden you can communicate in a, a totally different fa uh, ways. You know, you can, you can, uh, break up that visual, that, that, that linear storytelling, right? And by the way, uh, Tom does a great job of that in this book. Um, he has a whole series of concept maps and, uh, and, uh, and diagrams, which are just fascinating um, and, uh, and really, really deep. And I really recommend them uh, for that. So if you, if you need to talk to anybody about creating infographics, definitely talk to Tom. Sure, please, please keep going. Please keep going. I, I mean, I do, I do my best, uh, but uh, you know, and, and, you know, there are still, I still run up against technical barriers there, uh, but it's gotten a lot better. But the, what I try, one of the things I try to teach my students, for instance, is, is how to think about the structure of their work. And, and I force them into writing stuff, of course, but then I force them to take that writing and turn it into visual communication uh, mm -hmm. by jet building websites and things like that and saying, look, this works differently. Think about this site and the way this mm -hmm. works differently from the way you would think about uh, writing a paper in another class. Uh, you're, you're communicating similar information, but you can tell different kinds of stories mm -hmm. with different kinds of structures. And so one of the big things that I say, you know, I know that's not really the kind of structure you were asking about, but one of the things that I, you know, we have to recognize the structures are everywhere and we don't necessarily, we take them so much for granted in many cases that, that we don't challenge them. And digital technology challenges many structures. Now, if you go to a more traditional higher education structures, um, you know, if you think about does learning, why do we have classrooms? I mean, why are they there the way that they are? Why do we have, you know, butts and seats and all the other stuff that goes with classrooms? And there's structures that grow out of those classrooms because now all of a sudden you have a, you have a, 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 a sunk cost that um, you have to you have to use this classroom and then the campus around it. And some parts of the campus are more valuable than other parts of the campus. And different colleges and universities have different valuations on which ones are the most valuable and which ones aren't. There was, you know, for a long time, we've had this kind of debate about classroom formal learning spaces versus informal learning spaces and the and, and how informal learning spaces always get short shrift uh, in part because there's no one who's able to put their flag on it and say, this is mine, right? That's the whole point of an informal learning space, right? right. But these things right. create structures and classes, you know, the physical space. And I, you know, you know, I've done a lot of work on, on learning spaces as well. You have to look at these things and we're back to space too, but you have to look these things in, in context uh, of the larger structures that they both create and exist within. So we have classrooms. Okay. Classrooms now say, you have X number of students sitting in Y amount of space, and that's non-fungible, right? You can't put two classes yes. in the same classroom at the same time. Uh, it's non-fungible in the sense of fire codes and things like that oh, as well. Oh, oh. You can't put more students in there without, you know, creating other kinds of problems. You can't put more than one teacher in there. I mean, you can, but it's, you know, physically you have to... And then what about whiteboards and other kinds of, you know, you have a big oh, board at the front and that defines the, the space as well. well let, let me let me pause you yeah. for a second here, uh, because because I want to get to space. And that's a that's a, that's a huge subject for, for us to pull. I, I will come back to structures in part because you've gotten some really good questions and comments on them. Yep. And I, I, I want to make sure that we uh, that we adhere to them. Uh, I'm being so, a bad boy, not following the chat closely enough. It's all right. You don't have to. I'm, <laughs> you're you're the guest. You uh, do what you do. What is comfortable and best for you. Uh, Sarah San Gregorio points out that um, treating technology as appliances helps explain why we get so enraged with them. Um, yes, uh, and which is a really really good point. Um, we've also had some. Uh, um, uh, Carolyn Coward says she really appreciates the discussion around perception and value, uh, which is uh, I want to highlight that because that's that's really mm -hmm. very important. 
Um, and then also we had a really, really interesting comment from uh, Michelle Miller. Uh, she says, quote, it strikes me that the project created for an audience of one and usually discarded and forgotten right away is another structure that deserves challenge. I've been building in ways to make work more public for years and I need to do more. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm assuming she's talking about the, the audience of one being the instructor, the instructor. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and did yeah, you want to respond I, to that one? Well, I, you know, I, I can say that, um, all of the work in my class is public. Every paper is a blog that, I mean, every quote unquote paper, you know, the traditional role that a paper falls, uh, that, that, a, that a paper uh, has within an instructional uh, environment is, is a public discussion. I mean, I, I allow my students to create discussions in, and we use Canvas, so it has a functionality to do that. Um, and they all read each other's stuff as well as I read it, they all comment on each other's stuff. Um, and then in addition, the final product that they create is a public outside of Canvas website. And everything builds toward that, that website. And again, that's an artifact that they can keep with them moving forward. It has that permanence that a, uh, uh, it has that permanence that, it, you know, something shoved in versus something that's shoved into my filing cabinet for three years and then destroyed when we hit the Public Records Act end of or whatever it's called, right, uh, right, where right. we have to keep papers. Uh, yeah, I don't want them writing for me. I'm not their audience at the end of the day. Um, they think I am because I have that I because I dole right. out the value in the class, which is the grade. And um, um, and I'm trying really I've always struggled against that to try to get them to think much more broadly against how, how that works um, uh, in terms of, you know, sharing their ideas. So um, that's great. I uh, in, in, in the chat, uh, Carolyn um, adds, I'm sorry, Carolyn Crawford says my courses include uh, assignment uh, components called collegial community as mm -hmm. beyond the four walls. Uh, which is really, really neat. Uh, and then John Hollenbeck has a question for you. Let me put this on the screen. Um, is there a stage of innovation where it becomes invisible and thus people don't make websites anymore? But doesn't Marshall McLuhan's medium as a message still affect the learning environment? Well, I mean, the whole idea of technology should become is that it should become invisible. I mean, I use that metaphor in the book. Uh, when I talk, uh, you know, specifically around my photography, I mean, I, I do, as you know, I do a, 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 do some photography um, and people are always, uh, I remember people always come up to me and say, oh, you know, what kind of gear did you use to shoot this? And I said, it's not important. Um, I've been very conservative with, I'm conservative with technology as a whole. I'm not a curmudgeon, but if it, if it doesn't do what I need it to do, I'm not going to use it. All right. So I, my goal is what I can create with the technology, not what the technology itself is. And so within the world of photography, you have these gearheads who always have to have the latest and greatest gear and, uh, and spend huge amounts of money on stuff. Um, I am very conservative. I don't, I try not to buy more than, well, I don't buy, I haven't bought much lately at all because I've got what I need. But, uh, you know, as I was acquiring lenses, I never bought more than, say, a lens every six months to a year because it took that long for me to figure out how to use it to where oh, it became oh. invisible. You, you have, you know, with, with, a, with the key to good photography is not to be doing photography. The key to making music is not to be playing a violin. It's to make music. You may use the violin to make the music. Oh, if the violin has to disappear for oh, you. You should not be fighting with the technicalities of that or the piano or whatever. Pick your pick your instrument. Same thing's true with photography. The same thing is true with any other technology. I want to write. I don't want to use a word processor. You know, I want to take pictures. I don't want to use a camera. So um, oh, that, 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 that invisibility is absolutely critical. I mean, we have so many technologies we don't even think about that are, that are, that are, constantly a part of our lives. Now, sometimes we do need to step back and consider, are these things holding us back and keeping us from doing things? Um, but uh, sometimes, uh, but you know, this, this is a technology, this is a technology, this is a technology. It certainly is, yes. You know, uh, Kevin Kelly argues that we're, we are a technology, we've, we've grown ourselves into our technology. You know, because we invented cooking, we changed the biology of our digestive systems, for instance. Right. Right. You know, we can't eat raw meat all day long anymore. Uh, but, you know, and th he makes a good point. We are our, our first domesticated animal is us. <laughs> right. 
So that's another thing I have to say, you know, with, when it comes to technology is we need to look at that as an entire spectrum and pick the one that's appropriate to our needs. I've, I've, I've got to ask them that that's, well, first of all, first of all, John, that was a great question. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, John. And I threw into the chat a quote from a computer scientist I admire, Mike Weiser, Mark Weiser about that. Uh, and Tom, thank you for the, uh, for the answer. Friends, if you're new to the Future Transform, that's an example of using that Q&A button down there in the bottom of the screen, the question mark. Um, so just please feel free to toss in your Q or, or your A at any point. Uh, we'd be glad to share them with Tom. And you can tell he's eager, eager to, uh, to respond. Um, and uh, again, if you'd like to join us on stage, you don't have now to- Give me a dose of my own medicine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. You don't have to be in blue. Uh, just click the raised hand. And in fact, um, if that's if that's too much, let me just put this. Uh, click this little teal colored button, and it'll zap you up on stage right away. Uh, but um, I, let, let's get let's get over to space now. Uh, I mean, that's another huge theme in your book. And in your book, there's a great. In the final frontier. I'm not going to go there. Uh, the. Uh, <laughs> The uh, the great description. I mean, you're the one who said a lens should be invisible. I'm like, well, yes, right. That's the idea. But, um, but, uh, but you you have a great description of the project you worked on, the West Houston Institute. Um, mm -hmm. and you took a great deal about changing the sp the physical space of, mm -hmm. of learning. And I'm wondering if if you could just say a bit more about that. Um, and and friends, I, I would love to hear those of you who are interested in this. Please please chime in. How do we how do we redesign space to account for the design of technologies, and how has technology already changed the space that we're in? Well, the problem is it hasn't to to a great degree. I mean, essentially, you know, our our mutual friend Ruben has the SAMR model, and and most of the things we are seeing in classrooms, which are quote unquote technology, are substitution. Um, you know, people come to me and they go, I used, I mean, back in the day, I, I haven't done this job in, in a few years now, but people used to come to me all the time. I use technology in class. I use PowerPoint. I'm like, okay, well, can you explain to me how this is materially any different from the slides you used to make on, on, on pieces of transparent plastic? I mean, yeah, maybe prettier, but fact, functionally it's the same. You're doing the same thing, right? So, um, uh, uh, so, uh, and the way we design those rooms is, again, getting back to that earlier point I was making about classrooms, the rooms are still designed in those ways. Now, we have legacy classrooms as well, which is which is a major issue. Although, who knows, maybe COVID has solved that problem for us and we can just stop using those because the students aren't coming onto campus anymore. Uh, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, but uh, one thing about, uh, you know, the physical spaces, I, uh, the West Houston Institute... Um, I have, to, I have to be careful about how I talk about the West Houston Institute in the sense that um, there are a lot of unrealized things in that space that was designed by a team that has largely left the college. And this is a, this is, this gets back to that basic human problem. And um, people aren't really using the space. And this is, I've known this, this is this, I've known this was a problem all along when it comes to space, you can design the greatest classroom in the world mm -hmm. and, people will line up the chairs to face one direction of the room and tell nobody to move the furniture around, you know? Um, and the, the key to, I think, learning space design in, in now and in the future is, is just this idea of flexibility and fluidity and the, and the realization that students are going to learn differently in the sense that they don't have to be tied to a physical space to learn. I mean, that's never really been true, but we've kind of kidded ourselves to thinking that a lot of learning actually happens in a classroom. Uh, the reality is a study after study has shown that a small percentage of what a student learns in a given semester actually takes place within the physical classroom itself. There are exceptions, but, you know, in terms of how much they retain over the long term, deep learning that has to happen outside the classroom through their own self-learning through their own study through their peers and and that whole aspect of it that is often again a secondary concern to people designing spaces because they're all about capacity how many spa people can we get into this space actually the campus that is opening that i helped design that is opening in three weeks two weeks may, wow. middle of may um in, in some ways is learns from the lessons of the west houston institute in that the spaces are designed in such a way that uh, it, it really forces uh, 
people to use it in a very flexible, fluid way, and that can scale. So what that means is you walk into the building and um, the main area, and I wrote an article about this uh, a um, uh, few years back, called, it's called the STAC model, S-T-A-C, um, uh, which is, stands for uh, stickiness, tool sets, uh, adjacencies, and community. And this is a model for the, the heart of the campus, the center of the campus. This is really an informal learning space model in that you walk into this space, you have um, places where the students can sort of nest, where they can make, their, make, make, make themselves at home, where they can put together groups. You don't have to be taking physical classes in the building to do that. The, the, the design of this particular building was driven in part by uh, a mandate from the president who said to me, he said, we have, we, we're, we're being required by the board to have more people in this building that the square footage technically allows for. And uh, in terms of, cla you know, the enrollments expectations uh, for this particular building. And I said, well, OK, then you need to divorce this idea of square footage from enrollment. And of course, we've got digital tools. So build a building that's hybrid, you know, build a building for hybrid students as opposed to having that somehow be a separate thing. And we need to get away from these arbitrary distinctions of online versus hybrid versus in person. I think every class should have some element of that wherever possible, realizing that, of course, that if someone's taking a class that's a thousand miles away from the professor, the in-person aspect of it is going to be constrained, obviously. Yeah. But in most, the vast majority of distance ed students are not taking classes like that, especially at the undergraduate level. So, Build a campus that serves per someone who's taking classes online, who doesn't have the flexibility of schedule that allows them to be in English class from 930 to 11 every Monday and Wednesday without significant disruption because of work or family or other things. But that when they do have time to come in, there's a place for them. Right. They come into the space. And so this space, again, is designed to be very flexible and fluid. It's designed to have a lot of adjacent support areas. So it's got a. Um, Makerspace Design Lab right off the main informal, the main space in the middle is all informal learning, but you've also got informal support spaces like Design Lab, Library, uh, Counseling for the, um, don't forget the emotional side of all of this, and, um, and tutoring. And they're all right there when you come in and they're designed so that, you know, again, they're not, the classes are all upstairs. The classrooms are all upstairs because if you get assigned to a classroom, you're going to go to that classroom, right? I mean, right? So you put that in the back, the back part of the, the building. You put uh, the, the classrooms in the, because, you know, if somebody says to you, go to room 342, you're going to go to room 342. You know, if someone says, hey, you know what? You might want to go check out tutoring or go to the library or check out this makerspace. They're doing some cool stuff in there. It's up in the back corner of the building in room 342. You're never going to go there. No, 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 but you put it in the front. You put uh, it all in the front. And this all drives, again, from that whole idea of, of technology serving the campus. And so these are all technology spaces in certain ways. The building itself is a technology. And so that space aspect of it can really drive that community aspect. And the other part, the last part of the SAC model, so there's the adjacencies. With, with, you got to have the right support people, too, that are there on staff, librarians, people who get overlooked all the time in short staff, librarians, makerspace technicians, tutors, and counselors. Uh, and those guys need to be available as much as is budgetarily possible. We can't overlook the human aspect of this. And then give them an environment in which it's, they can work, where you have that fluid kind of environment. And oh, by the way, you can design online spaces that do exactly the same thing. As a matter of fact, it's easier wow. if, you have the tech, if you have the space for it. None of our LMSs are designed that way right now that I'm aware of. Mark Corbett Wilson asked in the chat, how do we expand this model to all users all the time? And perhaps that's that's one way is to apply that to uh, uh, online learning. Um, yeah. No, there's a, there's a virtual aspect to the stack model as well. And that's, a, that's actually a chapter in the book I wrote last year, Learn at Your Own Risk, is in here. But it, it's available online. It was published in uh, Current Issues in Education last year. Was that? Wait a minute. Again, can't pandemic. I have no idea of time anymore. Okay. <laughs> See, that was summer of 2020. So that was what almost two years ago. <laughs> it's it's hard to it's hard to describe at times. Uh, we, yeah. we 
uh, um, a couple of uh, questions that have come up, and uh, I want to make sure that we get a chance to uh, uh, share them. Uh, and a couple of comments. Michelle Miller points out that uh, at her institution, they have some rooms that are designed like you described, but no one can ask for them. They are only randomly available, uh, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Uh, Lisa Gustinelli, Roxanne Risky, and a few others have pointed out that when you ask students or the community what they want, either in a classroom or in a library, often it's comfort. Uh, they they mm -hmm. want a place where they can flop down and, and, and relax. Um, but we did have a question from Noah Geisel. Um, he says, you make a point to call out informal learning spaces. Learning happens whenever or wherever learning happens, even beyond mm -hmm. the walls of our, of our classes. What's your vision of a future that closes the disconnect between formal recognition of informal learning? Well, this gets back to the question of structure. Um, what I think we need to be working toward, it, okay, back to the classroom. If you have oh. classrooms, classrooms create schedules, right? And you can't manage classroom space without having a class schedule, right? So that means that the students, A, have to be physically in that place during that time, which for some students is not a problem. If you're in a residential college and that's your life, that's great. If you're in a commuter school where you may have a job or other responsibilities outside of college, that can become a real challenge, of course. Um, that's an equity thing. That's a, a, you know, is, is, is the fact that you have to make people be in the same place at the same time, but you have those schedules and those schedules drive metrics as, as Donnell Meadows likes to point out the measurement aspect of it, the, the, the lowest, lowest hanging fruit, you know, the, the, the way the board looks at your performance as a president is enrollment. Enrollment is driven by ultimately tied to these ideas of scheduling and physical presence on campus. And we've transferred that into the online environment, which is a complete McLuhan-esque mistake as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. But OK, fine. It's a bookkeeping thing, right? So the answer to the question is, uh, is that if you treat every learning experience as an informal um, as an informal experience that lasts a semester long and you allow the professor and the student to negotiate what that means to them over the course of that semester and you create environments that are flexible enough so that the professor can go, I need to meet with 10 students out of this class or this group or all of the students, or maybe I need to meet with multiple classes at the same time, but only do it twice a semester or do it, you know, at this point in the, in the process. Now you've kind of decoupled this idea of physical space and classrooms and schedules, most importantly. This is, this is the middle element that you kind of jumped over a little bit. This is time and how we structure time and how we think about time and how technology changes how, mm -hmm. first of all, technology created time in the first place. We didn't have time in the way that we have it now until the 19th century. I mean, we had clocks. But the way it regulated our clocks, it didn't matter until the point at which point you had to show up at a certain time in order to become part of the machine, which is called a factory. If, if no one shows up, on, if you're missing critical people in that assembly line, and remember, humans were part of the machine in the industrial age, mm -hmm. then the factory doesn't go. You know, if all the guys who are painting the car doors don't show up one day or, you know, then the factory doesn't go. Right. So you become part of that process and part of that machine. That's why we created time is for that. And, and education adopted that from an efficiency standpoint 100 plus years ago. And that, you know, we moved away from this much more informal, flexible model that we had in the pre-industrial era around education. Now, the problem with the flexible model is it's hard to scale because that was really just, you know, if you wanted to become a lawyer, you found a lawyer and you studied with that lawyer. And then at a certain point, you passed the bar and you became a lawyer. Same with a doctor. Of course, doctoring was a little different back in 1780 than it is today. You know, Barbara. as I like to tell my students, now we're talking about safe medical procedures. In 1780, there was no such thing as a safe medical procedure. <laughs> um, oh, you're safe for the physician. <laughs> right. But these structures, we have to recognize that they're, that, you know, we have artificial structures of time. We have artificial structures of space, which are tri tied to physical spaces. And if we, mix and match those physical and virtual spaces, 
then we can break down those structures, which allow us to create a much more informal learning process. The other problem with this is that I have to learn English between 930 and 11. That may not be my time best. I mean, I may not be thinking about English at that point. It may not be the best focus time for me for whatever reason, but it's the class I could, I could get because the schedule was full. Right. And so I'm in this class and I have to adapt and some students are good at it. And a lot of students are not. Uh, and to be able to turn on at that particular moment in time and, and learn on cue, learning doesn't work that way. Humans don't work that way. So you have to create a more, a more flexible environment where learning is ultimately a negotiation between the faculty or the teacher and the student. And how we measure learning is a negotiation between the teacher, the student, and the institution. Yes. Yes. Very much a negotiation. Right. Uh, this, this is terrific stuff, Tom. Uh, and, and friends, if you haven't read his, Tom's writing, you can see now why some of us love it so much. Uh, in, the, in the chat, Carolyn Crawford says, uh, "Education adopted the factory time because workers need to be shared up on, need to be talked yeah. show time, sit quietly until allowed to speak, button the seat, and not be allowed to move until the next bell, etc." Um, we have a, a question that comes up from uh, Lisa Gustinelli, which is a great question. We've been talking about the LMS, we've been talking about the classroom, but let's bring up another one. Uh, what do you think of Zoom and other similar platforms for distance learning? It seems to me the interface needs to be changed. It's time to get rid of the 20th century boxes of learners. What about virtual worlds? So <clears throat> I'd say ask me that question again in 10 years. Um, as, as we talked about a few weeks ago when we talked to Maya and Emery and the, the question that I brought up at that point, the XR technology that exists today is just not there yet. And, and there are significant chunks of the population, myself included, that have... Uh, physical issues and uh, accessibility issues to that, not to mention the cost and all the other stuff that goes with it, right? Yeah. So um, I'm not sure that's a viable alternative yet. But to get to the heart of the question and talking about Zoom, um, in some ways it's no worse than a, than a, than a room with the chairs bolted to the floor. Uh, yeah. In some ways it's a lot better. Um, you know, you have to think of these things in relative terms. I think that uh, of the platforms, uh, you know, in terms of things that I've actually had to try to teach in, uh, Zoom does provide me with the greatest amount of flexibility uh, in terms of both interacting with my students, the combination of Zoom and screen sharing. Um, I use uh, concept mapping fairly heavily in my in my classes with Miro uh, to not only to hammer home the visual communication idea. And sometimes I use it to help them understand complex concepts by drawing a picture for them, right? But also because it's interactive, um, my students, what, what I did today, for instance, with my students is I, I have an ideology um, uh, 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 grid, essentially, where you, where, when you're talking about um, uh, ideology, it's really on two, 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 uh, two planes. You've got uh, freedom versus equality. You know, how much freedom are you going to take away from those people who have stuff, whatever that stuff may be, power, money, capabilities, and give it to people who don't have it, right? That's essentially, that's one question of ideology. That's one trade-off you have to make. This is a fundamental, it, it's the heart of what we think of as civil rights, Mm. In, in many ways. Okay. And, mm. and it crosses the spectrum. And again, it's, it, we'd like to think of it as just, you know, I don't want to pay taxes to pay for these people to do X, Y, and Z, have right. healthcare, go to school, et cetera, et cetera. That's one aspect of it. Uh, but it's also power. You know, I, I don't want to give up my uh, advantages when it comes to access to voting rights as, and make it easier for these people. That's also the same question. It's just, it's just spelled out a little bit differently. It may not be, it's power and money. Then the, the other one is uh, your relationship with government and how much government pushes back on you. In other, and civil liberties is basically what it boils down to. Freedom versus order. How much order are you willing to give up? How much freedom are you willing to give up in order to achieve a certain amount of order? You know, if you like lots of anarchy, try Somalia out for a while and see how it goes for you, right? But on the other end, if you want too much order, well, that has some problems, too. You know, as I tell my students, this would be a very simple class in North Korea. 
uh, plenty of order, right? Um, but anyway, so you you put these two things on, you know, freedom in the top left corner, equality on one side and, and order on the bottom. And this creates a grid, right? And most American politics falls into liberal, libertarian, and conservative. There's a fourth one, which is called communitarian. Mm -hmm. American political culture just really doesn't sustain that. But that's lots of order and lots of equality. Think China more than uh, sort of. That's a long discussion. Don't want to get it. Anyway, so what I had my students, I put this in Miro, and my students have been working on these challenges all semester. And so what I asked them to do today is to say, okay, we're getting to a point now where we're proposing policies and solutions to these challenges that, that we've been working on. Where do they fit on this challenge? I mean, what are you asking people to do? Are you asking them to go more toward equality? Are you asking them to go more toward freedom versus order or more order? You know, most of them are not too conservative, to be honest, but uh, or at least they find out they're not too conservative. Uh, but, you know, people think they're asking for something that's very liberal, but it's actually pretty libertarian. Things like access to voting and stuff like that, which is really a libertarian thing because one of the key tenets of libertarianism is to be able to throw the bastards out. And so if you don't have good voting rights, it's hard to do that. Right. Um, so, you know, and this gets them to reframe the problem, but again, I'm having them do that interactively in Miro, sharing the screen with zoom as an exercise and, and then discussing it and going through it and saying, okay, what if we move this over here a little bit more? Do you understand how this goes? It's a very powerful tool. So zoom gives me a lot of freedom to do that sort of stuff. Uh, I also think it's a much flatter platform than some of the alternatives. Um, I, it's the danger with remote learning is um, the sage on the stage. It's very easy to do that and just keep talking like I'm doing right now. Um, and the, the difficulty and something you pull off rather well is, is getting the audience involved. This audience is unusually motivated compared to my students. Uh, my students will just sit there and let me, yak all day long and i have to come up with multiple team ways of connecting with them but your class is a required class for all students isn't it yep yeah so and almost no one wants to take it <laughs> almost everybody here is here voluntarily uh, true true huge difference but the other thing is that the way we've learned to do education is we've turned students into widgets and um in the industrial model you know people are like students are our customers i'm like no they're not they're our product um, this is a re-education camp. This is not, they're not, they're not customers in the sense of someone buying a car from me. Um, they are, and, and I'm not saying that in a, in a pejorative way. I'm just saying that that's the way the system is designed, right? Now, when we start talking about individualized learning and we talk about serving the students, because the way to think about individualized learning, we're serving the students but we're also serving the larger community because we're creating better widgets that are more self-directed widgets that are more, uh, and they're more individualized, right? That the, that, and we're working, it's more artisanal, right? Our production of, of stuff, the more individualized we can get. Digital technology can be, ex, digital technology makes everything, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it tends to do the emperor has no clothes, right? So, um, one of the things that struck me over the last several years is uh, in some places, particularly, uh, I mean, I, it's never really clear where these places are, but students hate online learning. And I think that's not necessarily because it's any worse or better than what they were experiencing in the classroom, but it's more distant and alienating because of the digital distance that we have here. Well, and hold on, hold on yeah. one second, hold on one second. Um, yeah. You know, Lisa Durf already teased you, for, you know, saying, oh, you think you talk too much. Um, <laughs> let me, but another Lisa um, had a question and she volunteered kindly to be on stage. And let me see if I can bring her up. Um, this is Lisa Gustinelli who asked a great question. Oh, and, uh, an old and good friend. Hello, Lisa. Maybe I should, uh, maybe I should have um, put on my camera. I'm sorry. <laughs> we okay. had it on before, but go ahead. Uh, all right, it's not letting me turn on, but okay. Oh, go ahead. Well, um, well, no, what I'm I'm talking about is I I'm in a K twelve school as an instructional technologist. I'm also at the university, so you, I get I get both ends of it. But uh, when we when students K twelve students were uh, at home learning during the mm -hmm. lockdown, I, what I was talking about Zoom was 
to me, Zoom is a classroom with rows of chairs and seats where you can't get up, you can't move, you're not comfortable. Younger children really had a hard time uh, mm -hmm. sitting or even, you know, all the way up to high school students had a hard time sitting in, in front of a computer and interacting with a, a teacher as a box. Mm -hmm. And so I just threw out the virtual world. I know we're not ready for that. Yeah. But, but I, because we're in the future trends forum, yeah. I'm saying that I believe that there's going to be, we're always talking about uh, learning spaces at, in the physical space. Yep. I think there is going to be a big change in the learning space on uh, the online, in, the interface, mm -hmm. the online platform. Now, what what is that going to be? Too bad it can't be a virtual world because that would be interesting. Um, oh, why, why not? I mean, but, I'm just um, saying that the technology that, that exists today doesn't get there. us there. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I know teachers got very creative and had, had to keep kids happy. They put videos up. They did breakout rooms. But um, it's you're mm -hmm. still in a chair in front of a device. So I will say uh, that uh, there is absolutely more of a need for that in person. This is there's not it's not a light switch like anything else for younger children. It's pretty clear from the data. And I'm not an expert on elementary education, but what I've seen and, and read about there, you need that human interaction element, the socializing aspect of it. Um, I think as we get older, that you can experiment with more hybrid types of environments once you get to junior high, high school levels, and of course, higher education. Uh, and in some instances, that's absolutely necessary. But yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm not suggesting that we do virtual school for first graders. As a rule, um, uh, you know, obviously, we don't want to kill them with the virus either, or their parents or grandparents. Please, let's, let's not do that. That would be bad. Yeah. Um, Lisa, have you have you tried uh, any of the uh, other platforms? I mean, obviously, Shindig here has a lot of differences, um, yeah. but I'm also, I'm also thinking of uh, uh, InSpace yeah. from Vermont, for example. Yeah, I've tried some. Of, well, I've been participant as a participant in different webinars and things where I've tried um, all the different all the different platforms, and some are better from than others. Uh, some have really good uh, breakout. I, I think that that's a big important thing is is the the setup of the breakout rooms if you're doing uh, a webinar. Um, I, I think we constantly talk about collaboration and education, and then we get on Zoom and everybody's just in there on a box, and that's where where I feel like we're missing something but i know it's developing and and going forward and maybe it's something to keep looking out for changes in the in the online platform just as agreed. one day we realized the physical space needed to be changed mm -hmm. agreed agreed that's one of the big pushes behind facebook is basically ultimately with their uh, online with uh, the metaverse is to compete with zoom uh and and video conferencing um i i i, I hate to wrap things up uh lisa but and tom but but we're right at the end of the hour um, and, and you asked a great topic. Uh, Lisa, yeah. how, uh, we can find you through uh, Arizona State, through uh, Shaping EDU? Yeah, it's, um, I'll, I'll put it in there. It's just L-G-U-S-T-I-N-E at A-S-U dot E-D-U. I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Thank you. That's a great video. Thank you very much. Um, Tom, Tom we're, we're right at the end of the hour. You've you got a minute to say your, your last words. Well, I, yeah, just real quick as a response to what Lisa and others are saying is that it's not the technology, it's what you do with it. And and I think depends on the pl the platforms can be technology platforms or technologies can be limiting. And you need to understand that you shouldn't accept that. You should always be looking for how do I express myself authentically as a human being, as a teacher, as a creator. Uh, and that's what should drive your technology choices. Uh, and so Zoom versus Shindig versus, you know, what what exactly, you know, think, think through your task first and work backwards to the technology. Because at a certain point, you know, you get to a point where, am I going to take a better picture with a Canon or a Nikon? Right? You know, uh, it's what, what, does the, what does it for you, right? Well, um, I'll tell you what does it for us is to have you thinking uh, with us and talking about this. Uh, that the, you, you, you instilled a great deal of energy in the chat with all kinds of questions and comments. 
Um, my, you know, the question I like to ask everybody is, uh, where can we find you uh, online? Is, is Twitter the best way to keep up with you or your blog? Yeah, Twitter's usually, I mean, whenever I write something, I definitely uh, tweet about it uh, on Twitter. Um, I do uh, write a lot for Shaping EDU on their blog, uh, and, and and I do put things on, on my blog. Shaping EDU, they just upgraded to a new, Arizona State just upgraded to a new version of Drupal and managed to lock me out of the Shaping EDU blog, so that's one reason why oh. my blog, it's on my site, which tends to get a little less traffic, but it's about eyeballs. I'm not trying to make any money off of it. Oh, Noah, Noah shared a, a, a link, uh, so so thank you. Yeah. And Tom, thank you. Thank you so much for spending an hour with us, uh, unfolding you. your thought, sharing your, your fierce creativity, your fierce wisdom. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, please, well, I'm looking forward to bringing you back on stage as often as I possibly can. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the meantime, please, please uh, take care and be safe. Thank you. Um, but don't go away yet. Let me just, everyone, let me just uh, mention a bit more about uh, where we're coming from. And, but, but I just want to mention again, this is great to see uh, all these questions and topics. If you want to keep talking about this, if you want to keep thinking about uh, structures for improving learning, if you want to think about the purpose of education, we can keep tweeting at this at FTTE as the hashtag, or tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or Shindig Events, or hit up my blog, brianalexander.org. Uh, if you'd like to go back into our previous sessions, not only to scope out Tom, but also to find some of our previous discussions, including about space and about revolutions in teaching, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, looking ahead, if you'd like to keep joining us, uh, and I want to welcome folks like Adam who joined us for the first time, we have sessions coming up on equity, climate crisis, transformation, public higher ed, digital four design and web three, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us and you can learn more. And if you'd like to just celebrate, like we did with Tom, anything great that you've done, shoot me a note. I'd be delighted, delighted to hear from you. Um, in the meantime, thank you all for being great participants, for supporting all of us. We really, really appreciate it. It's a delight to think together and learn together with all of you. Uh, good luck the rest of this month of April. Please take care, work hard, and be safe. We'll see you online next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>